What I'm going to be sharing with you this afternoon are two actually reports, two research uh, assignments that have not been published. So even if you would Google them later on this afternoon, you will not find anything about them. And it's about the taste of togetherness and about food care. And we're going to actually walk you through each one at a time. So it starts with, have things changed in the world of families? And are families actually dealing with food in a different way today than they might have 10, 15 years ago? And it's really interesting to ask the question, are the way families eating, is that changing? And what actually are the new food moments that are appearing on the menus of modern families? You know we're a data-driven organization. So this team, the Human Truth team, went to work. They spoke with over 1,100 individuals and asked them about their food behaviors. We went through eight markets around the world. So this is not just in the U.S. It is the U.S., India, the U.K., Mexico, Brazil, France, Japan, and Germany. We dig through 40 billion searches as it relates to food and groceries in 2016, and about 30 billion as it relates to cooking and recipes. In addition to that, we dug into a variety of great white papers all about food. So there is some data behind what I'm going to be sharing with you momentarily. No surprise to you and probably leads to us is busier schedules for consumers is making it easier for families to eat together. And what we're starting to see, that families are eating more and more fragmented. There are fewer occasions where we're eating together. The second one might actually surprise you, especially in the US, we're eating smaller meals together, but that's only because we're snacking more throughout the day. And then the third one is there's more and more solo eating taking place even at home. And it has to do with the very busy schedules that we're all living these days. And guess what? Even when we are together, we have the little device that appears to be more important than the great family members that we live with. 68% of the consumers in the eight markets that we actually did research in will use their phone while having family dinner. So you might think, it's the end of the world, it will never be what it was. But actually, I'm here to share with you that there are great bright spots ahead of us that we as, as members of the industry can absolutely work on and actually capitalize on. So what families are doing, they're not actually getting really upset about the fact that the typical meal moment is changing. They're looking at actually new moments that are going to be meaningful in their lives. So what we've learned through our research, that families are creating four key categories of new, opportunity, of new opportunities to spend quality time and food together. And I'm going to walk you through each of those four. What is very clear to us as well, that food continues to be so much more than just sustenance. It was, it is, and it will truly be a platform for togetherness. And while you and I might really believe that the typical 6 p.m. weekday meal is no longer there, and while that might be true, amazing new experiences are coming in their place. So our Human Truth team basically discovered four human truths that reveal how modern families are using food D-Days as, as a way to get together. And I'll give you a little bit more context than what you see over here. So the first human truth is we're putting the we into weekend meal times. So parents lament the disappearance of weekday family meals and invest more and more time and energy into weekend eating occasions. They offer an opportunity to make up for lost time so families host large and leisurely meals and try new dishes and look for foreign flavors. That is human truth number one. The second one is they're setting the stage, not just the table. It is truly becoming about the overall experience and not just the sustenance. The third one, which is interesting as well, is they're showing love from afar through food. So families are using food to show love and foster a sense of camaraderie, even when they cannot be physically together via a variety of different things specially constructed lunch boxes, carefully planned care packages, as well as family good conversations. 
and technology is helping actually them as well by creating new ways of expressing old habits. All kinds of opportunities over there. And then the fourth human truth that we find as in this sense of togetherness, they're feeding food sense and appreciation. But let me give you a little bit more detail with this. So the first one is, whenever we thought it was about the weekend meal, it is now truly about the weekend experience. And what you see then as well is that Saturday morning has become the new actually family meal. That is the first opportunity for families to get together, to invite and really enjoy time together. The second food movement as a result of the first family truth is the family food voyage. It is no longer always going to the same place you've always been before, but really thinking through this overall experience, where can I take my kids where we have not been before? And then the third food moment over here is the extended Sunday spread. And that might be a very leisurely brunch or a great, great family dinner on Sunday night. Human truth number two, they're setting the stage, not just the table. Interesting elements that we have found. So this is not where we are actually interpreting the data. This is really analyzing what people are looking for. So what we learned is that people are actually searching for al fresco dining. So instead of just focusing on food, they're thinking about the overall experience, al fresco eating, all family eateries. As the focus these days is so much more on kids, which restaurants or venues are kids friendly? And then the third one surprised even me, the secret home cinema. Because you might say, being in a cinema or actually watching a movie together might not be this magical meal moment. But actually what it is, people are thinking through, let's pick a, a movie together. Let's think through what snack might go with that. Let's make the snack together and then snuggle up to really have this magical home experience. Human truth number three. They're showing love from afar through food. Elements to think through. Lunchbox love care packages and the family food forum. So the lunchbox love is really about, can I actually get my kid something special in their lunchbox, but it's a little note or the special treat or the care package for actually those of your kids that are at college. And then the third one is really interesting as well using technology, the family food forum, having this family app where you can have, have the discussion around what are we gonna do for dinner this evening what are the recipes, where are we going to shop, and then afterwards posting the pictures, or if your kids are already in college, sharing what you're eating and what your kids are eating. And then the fourth human truth in this act of togetherness, they're feeding food sense and appreciation. What was really clear as well based on the search behavior is that we're longing to actually to share with our kids where food is coming from. Milk does not come from aisle six in a supermarket. And that's what actually parents want to share with their kids as well. The second one is to use the supermarket experience as a great way to teach your kids about food. And then last but not least, to use the cooking conversation as well to bring families together. So based on what we have actually have searched and researched, the four human truth as it actually relates to how modern families are actually dealing with the very rapidly changing schedules and food. What is clear as well, that actually the term family eating is broadening from this set time every day, the 6 p.m. dinner, to now really it's including the weekend extravaganza, extravaganza. From sitting at the table to really eating and engaging spaces from sharing food in person to sharing food across distances and spending time eating together to actually including as well learning and creating together. That's where you have it, the act of togetherness. The second set of insights I want to share with you is food care. I do believe that many of you have heard of the Generation Z and the Millennials, and they might be slightly different in the way how they interact with food than maybe you and I. So we did quite a bit of research with that as well. And maybe as a starting point, what is very clear based on all the search research that we have, that health is now becoming a major priority for food brands. Our diets are under a spotlight. 
So many actually of the diseases we're struggling with are diet related. And it's really interesting then to look at how is big, medium and small food responding to that. And what is very, very clear to us that the re industry is responding by focusing on what their products don't have. So you'll see all these labels these days that articulate this product does not have X, Y, and Z. And what we're learning actually that is not what resonates with millennials and with Gen Zs. What they're searching for is actually what is in my food and what does my food do to me. So they're actually looking for the benefits of food, bone broth benefits, avocado benefits, or kombucha benefits. So it's a very different starting point than what ultimately big food is sharing with the consumer as of today. So it made us wonder as an organization, what are food brands missing today? What especially the millennial Z, sorry, the millennials and generation Z is looking for as it relates to both food and health. What is interesting as well is that the new generation is probably more educated about food and health and its connection than ever before. And if you think that they're just searching for avocado benefits, we or I am wrong. Because they're looking actually for avocado benefits for skin or for hair and for weight loss. And the other one just to really call out as well, Gen Z and the millennials are not using Google search. They're using YouTube. It's a very different world out there for them. So when you think about that, many brands are focused on actually what they don't have as, as of today. Gen Z and the millennials are looking for the benefits that food actually elements do have. And what is really, really clear for us based on the research we've done, it is truly about the mind, body, beauty, and mood. So millennials and Gen Z are looking for the benefits that food can bring to them as it relates to the mind, the body, beauty, and mood. And they're really using food in different ways than we've ever done before. For them, food is fundamental to who they are and how they live. And they're really using food as a way to care for themselves. And they would actually use the term food care, maybe not directly in the way I just said it, but they're really using food as a way to care for themselves. Based on that, we have discovered that basically the millennials and Gen Z are using food for peak mental performance to boost their body's health, using food as a building block for beauty, as well as a way to regulate their mood. Let me dig a little deeper. So they're using food for peak mental performance. This generation is more pressured than maybe any generation before, constantly being asked to be at their best. They're looking for foods that can help them with them, with that. They're looking as well for foods that will help them build their memory and recall, as well as actually food that cares for their cognition. Very different than the benefits maybe you and I are looking for today. They're looking for as well for foods to boost their body's health. So instead of just actually taking another pill, adding more chemicals to their body, they're trying to find ways to use food to help them with a specific disease or to prevent a disease by boosting their immunity or actually using specific foods as well to defend, a specific, uh, to defend against specific diseases. And then you have to bear in mind as well that there are a lot of beliefs out there because as you can imagine when you go online, but it's actually on Google search, another search platform, or YouTube, you will find a lot of stuff, but it doesn't mean that what you find is really the absolute truth, especially as it relates to actually nutrition and health. The third one is millennials and Gen Z are using food as a building block for beauty. And I think what is so interesting over here as well, think about the impact on of food on your body and tie it to how many selfies can you take in a day? I'm telling you. Because if you, if you look at the search, there, search data over there as well, the connection between food and selfies is pretty uh, amazing. So the new generation is looking as well for food to help them with specific actually health challenges they're dealing with. To think through 
how can I actually make my hair glow or be b more beautiful than it's ever been before? Or knowing that I'm going to live a longer life, what foods should I eat throughout my year, throughout my life, in order to live the most gracious life? And then last but not least, they're using foods to regulate their mood. What is very, very clear as well is that the newer generation is much more comfortable to talk about, to be about uh, mental health issues. And they're willing and able to think through what foods can help me to better regulate my mental state. So when you bring that all together, the four human truths that we discovered as it relates to how the new generations are, u are using food to care for their mind, body, beauty, and, mute, and mood. Last but not least, you can see as well that the vocabulary is changing. So from smart food choices, they're now looking actually for food that makes them smart. From basic nutrition to benefit boots. From inner sustenance to outer appearance. Think about the selfies again. And then last but not least, from emotional indulgence to emotional regulations. Really interesting what you can learn from digging into search data in our broader platform. Many of the reports will be available over the, over the quarters to come. But it is really clear is that the internet, search, uh, search functions, really can provide you with all kinds of interesting data. Last but not least, what is already available for you is ultimately the platform Think with Google. Actually, our platform through which we share all kinds of data, both about food as well as how you can actually dig more data out of the internet. And obviously, the one is Google Trends as well. And with that, I've hopefully given you a good starting point of actually the future of food according to us. I thank you. So as a millennial who frequently eats food, I co-sign everything that Michael just said. Um, speaking of which, our next speaker is Eve Turopal, who is a journalist, millennial expert, and author of A Taste of Generation Yum. Please welcome her. Good afternoon, everyone. Or good evening, if you're like me and just landed from New York and feel a little discombobulated. <laughs> so Michael, thank you for all of that. Uh, I think it was the perfect setup, and I'm hoping I can just build on um, the data that he provided. So I'm here today to talk a little bit about understanding food culture and really about understanding millennials, Gen Z, where things are going. So why do I have the right to talk about this is the number one question. So I spent the last seven years researching why it is that young people today are so obsessed with food. And this actually all began. In 2010, I moved to New York City for, to get my writing degree in creative nonfiction writing with Larissa, who you guys are going to see later. Hey, hey, new school. Larissa and I were actually the only two people in our program who were interested in writing about food. Everyone else was there writing their memoir at age 26. But that didn't matter, because every break that we had, someone was pulling out their phone to say, look at where I went to dinner last night. Or judging people, you haven't been to Momofuku? What is wrong with you? OK, we were, again, 2010, so still peak recession time, in New York City, one of the most expensive cities in America, as writing students, OK? Which is basically like having a badge, like, we're broke. We should not have been spending our money on going out to eat. We should have been spending our money on like laundry and rent, but that's not what we were doing. And I became very confused, and I decided to figure out what was going on. And once I decided to figure out what was going on, I realized that the story was far more complicated than I had anticipated. So I spent the next four years doing research on this, and I did it in three different ways. So number one, I shadowed millennials across the United States who participate in food in a, in a variety of ways. So one side of it was people who made lists of restaurants that they wanted to try. Some of them were like categorized by location or type of food. They were very impressive. All the way to folks who said, mom and dad, I'm really sorry. I don't want to be a doctor or a lawyer. I really just want to be a brewer or a butcher. And then I also had the opportunity to speak to some of the leading luminaries in the food scene. I worked for Mark Bittman for a year. I got to talk to Michael Pollan and Anthony Bourdain and say, listen, you guys have been in this industry for what, decades at this point. What do you think is happening? Why are you so popular now? 
And then the final part of the research was I actually, I think, was the most important part of this. My undergraduate degree was in psychology. And through all of these interviews, there were a few different topics that kept coming up over and over again that I wanted to get a deeper understanding of. And so I dug back into academia to see what researchers were finding in the areas of psychology, sociology, anthropology, you name it. Anything that I could find that would better inform my own understanding of what I was seeing, basically through ethnographic research, I was going to tackle. So today I'm here to present some of those learnings to you and also where I've been researching post-Generation Yum. So first, millennials spend an unprecedented amount of their income on food. Actually, there's a slide that's missing in here. Anyway, there are a lot of millennials. This was really supposed to be the first thing here. There's a map. Um, so millennials are a quarter of the global population. Should I get a hand mic, do you think? OK. I don't want to hurt you guys, your ears. Um, so millennials are 25% of the global population, 25% of the US population. Generation Z, the generation younger, is another 26%. So we're really talking about 51% of the global population. So when anyone talks about these generations, they are massively overgeneralizing. But there is one key area where you can generalize, which is that we are obsessed with food. And that's proven out in our spending. It's proven out in the Google trends. Right? So globally, 6 in 10 millennials are going out to eat at least once a week, which is twice the rate of baby boomers. For the first time ever, Piper Joffrey found that teens are spending more on food than on clothing. And the one that I really love that SurveyMonkey came out with last year is that they found that over 40% of millennials are spending more on coffee every year than they're putting away in savings. <laughs> so I did my research in the United States. And the book came out about two and a half years ago. I really did it as like a fun project, thought no one was going to read it. And then suddenly the phone starts ringing of people around the world saying, hey, this is not an American trend. This is happening here, too. And a couple years ago, I had the opportunity to go and travel to Seoul. I actually was presenting at Google in Korea. And this young woman came up to me after my presentation who worked there at Google and was like, that was so me. How did you know that was so me? And I was like, I don't know how I knew that was so you. And we're still in touch because there's so much about us in the way that we live our lives that's in sync with one another. And the question is, is why is that possible? Why are we seeing this happening all over the world? mostly in urban centers, but with young people everywhere. And the truth is that it's the one other thing that you can generalize about is that this is a generation that's also obsessed with technology. I mean, that stat that you had about being a, like so addicted that they can't put down their phones during family dinner is like super sad, but we'll also get into that later. <laughs> but it's because of this that the human experience has in many ways become homogenized. We are all sitting at our desks during the day and clicking, right, typing. So that girl's experience at Google in Korea, though she's literally on the other side of Earth from me, it really wasn't that different from my reality. We're getting our news in similar ways, right? We both, unfortunately, know about Kim Kardashian and things of that sort. We also, it turns out, have the same anxieties. Another really important note here is that it's also for this reason that when we say millennial or Gen Z, it's a little bit more of a mindset than it is a demographic. It's really a psychographic. So there's plenty of people who are Gen Xers or baby boomers who are also living a life that's infused in the digital age. And they're also going to be showing a lot of these same behaviors. Technology ultimately is what makes everything different. When I say the digital age, I mean life post iPhone. So that's post 2007. Do you have your head around it? It's only been since 2007. It's like think about how much the human experience has evolved. So this is what I call the new dictionary. I did not make up any of these words. They're all real. The first one on here is nomophobia. It's the fear of not having or not being able to use your cell phone. OK, this is a real anxiety that psychiatrists are trying to get entered into the DSM, which is what you use to formally diagnose patients. This is the panic that you feel when your battery bar turns red. The next is anxiety, also known as phantom vibration syndrome, which is the mistaken feeling that your cell phone's ringing, even when it's not. Raise of hands if you felt this. Yes. The third one on here is techno stress, which is the feeling of being overwhelmed by the persistent inundation of content. Right? You, you saw Twitter try to mitigate for this a couple years ago when they started curating your tweets. Right? That was like in case you missed it or while you were away. And now why would they do that? Because Twitter is incredibly anxiety inducing. 
right? You read like five tweets and they're like, there's 10,000 more now. And you're like, I don't know how to do this. And then your email is also gonna be ping pinging at you. And maybe your Slack is gonna be pinging at you. Maybe your group texts are gonna be pinging at you. That is techno stress. The last one on here is a newer one for me. It's called fubbing. And this is the act of snubbing somebody while you're with them in person looking at your phone instead of looking at them. I am just waiting until the phrase fub you catches on. <laughs> and what I found through my research, and this is what I'm really focusing on now, is the ways in which the digital age is disrupting many of our core human needs. So anyone want to shout out what this is? Maslow's hierarchy of needs, awesome. So though our environment has drastically changed in the last 10 years, we as homo sapiens, we haven't really changed in like 50,000 years. So now you're dealing with an animal that was built for the hunter-gatherer lifestyle that's now looking at food porn all day. And what I began to understand is that the digital age is disrupting every single part of Maslow's hierarchy, and that slowly but surely we are turning back to our hunter-gatherer roots and coping through food culture. So first, let's start at the bottom. Maslow put food at the bottom along with sex and sleep, right? You just needed to do it in food um, in order to survive. I've kind of combined these. Safety and control, protection from the elements, security, order, law, stability, and then I think this is the most important part, freedom from fear, anxiety, and chaos. Now who here feels like we're living in a mighty chaotic time? Well, so this is showing up in a lot of different ways. One of the key things that I had never expected in my research and what I was directed to almost immediately is the fact that millennials are the most depressed, anxious, stressed out, and loneliest generations on record ever. And this is for a lot of different reasons. Some of it relates to tech, some of it doesn't. Some of it's the recession, student loan debt. I mean, there are some statistics up here that I find sh shocking on one hand and expected on the other. When asked whether they're hopeful or fearful about the future, in America, 51% of millennials have indicated they're more fearful. There are statistics that Pew has asked, can you trust people, yes or no? Only 19% of millennials agree you can trust people. Versus almost 50% of baby boomers saying yes. When I'm asked of future plans that I may have in sight, I describe in great detail what I'll eat tonight. So what I ended up finding through my research, through all of these interviews, was young people were saying, I have no idea if I'm ever going to be able to buy a house, if I'm ever going to pay off my student loan debt, I don't know if my city is going to be underwater in 50 years, I don't know if I've been hacked and who has my information, I don't really know how the internet works. I don't really have control over anything. But what I do have control over is what I eat at least three times a day. And you're seeing this show up in a variety of ways. So yes. In part, it's I don't trust big food because they've made us sick, right? So there's that base of distrust. The other part of it is I want to have authority over something in my life, and I don't trust what the food companies are putting on their labels. So I want simple ingredients. I want non-GMO, not because I know what GMOs are, because most people don't, but because I know that there's some big agrochemical company that's telling me, don't worry about it which is what you don't want to do when marketing to this generation. Right, but there's all different ways that people are asserting their authority over their food. Sometimes it's cooking at home, right? Sometimes it's actually going and taking a class in butchery, which is happening now all over. It started on the coasts, now it's happening in the Midwest. I just met a guy who has started butchery classes in Berlin. This is, again, not an American trend, it's everywhere. Now it's not like I am going to bring a calf home to my Brooklyn apartment, be like, honey, dinner, <laughs> right? That's not gonna happen. But people just wanna know where their food is coming from. They're finally looking up and being like, oh wait, I'm eating a cow, that's what my steak is. And I'm really interested to know, like, where was that cow grazing? Who raised it? How far has it traveled? What it actually is a sirloin steak, right? This is all about control. Now one of the other interesting parts of my research that I, again, had not been expecting was finding that a lot of these restrictive eating diets are another means of self-soothing. So I had an interview with this young woman who had left her career in corporate America and become a cheesemonger. And I was like, great, we'll talk about curds. And 
she very quickly went into the story that she had dealt with anorexia throughout her childhood. And then, you know, now today she's working in cheese. And I said to her, I was like, well, how did you get over that? She said, well, I haven't. She said, when I was younger, I used to self-soothe by not eating. And today I self-soothe by only eating organic and local. And this was a major light bulb moment for me. So I went back to academia and found everything that I could find. And it turned out there were several studies indicating, um, especially in the gluten-free, vegan, and locavore communities, um, signs of eating disorders, behaviors that were parallel to people with eating disorders. Again, this is not saying that those people are harming themselves. It is that there's a solace that's brought by kind of putting in the bowling lanes for yourself and saying, I'm in control of this. If it has that paleo label or that vegan label, I can trust it. I have authority over something. All in all, young people are looking for things that they can understand, they can break down, that they have authority over. So moving on to the next one, which is love and belonging. So after you've satisfied your need for some kind of control, sense of safety, you're going to want to find love and acceptance and feel like you're a part of a group. But there's another problem today with doing that. I'm confused, a total mess, terrified of rejection, but you'll never know because my Instagram's perfection. Now, millennials are often considered the most narcissistic generation on record, right? That's like one of the first things when I started this research. It was like, okay, so my generation's narcissistic, lazy, and we're terrible people. And I'd like to say that that's not true, <laughs> but <laughs> statistically, <laughs> We are the most narcissistic generation on record. But what I realized is that that's for a very good reason. While we used to just worry about how we were presenting ourselves in person, with a haircut or our outfits or tattoos, today young people have to manage multiple online avatars of themselves. They need to be a different person on LinkedIn to get a job, then they need to be on OkCupid to get a date, then they need to be on Instagram to show their friends how great their life is, even when it's probably in shambles. And now, more than ever before, food is being used as a branding mechanism. Right? So say that you go to the grocery store, you get your kale, your organic kale, and make a vegan cashew Caesar dressing. Great, good for you. But the minute you take a picture of that and post it online, you are using that photo as a brand statement. You're trying to tell people, hey guys, I'm educated. I know about organic. I care about fair trade. Um, I'm super altruistic. I roasted the kale stems, hashtag no food waste. <laughs> right, I'm at that trip to Korea. I ended up eating um, an octopus, like a baby octopus that was still alive and the tentacles were still like, you know, whatever, suctioning to the, to the chopsticks. Now, did I take a video and post that to my Instagram feed? Yes. Of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> right, because I wanted to show my friends and even my husband. I'm like, check out how adventurous I am. <laughs> Right? Look how worldly I am. Now there's another reason why people are so focused on this performance, and it's because, and this directly relates to Michael's research, is that people have lost their tribes. You don't have the same kind of connection with your family that you once did, you don't have the same connection to your religious institutions as you once did, and people are looking for others that share their value systems, that they can just share a meal with. And so you're seeing the rise of community dinners, um, you're seeing a bizarre interest in celebrity chefs, right? You know, they, people don't want to just go to someone's restaurant. They want to know the backstory. They want to feel like they're in the chef's kitchen with them, right? But so there's another part of this restrictive eating because people aren't just identifying themselves and creating communities based around what they do eat. They're creating communities based on what they don't eat. I love this quote. It's from a piece in the New York Times a while ago. It's making the point that 10 years ago, no one was like, hey, I'm Joe, I'm an Atkins dieter. I'm Suzanne, I'm a Weight Watcher. And today, it's not uncommon to go on people's profiles and they're saying, hey, I'm Suzanne and I'm a vegan dentist from Ohio. I'm Bob, I'm a paleo crossfitter and I'm an architect. Right? People are literally identifying themselves by what they do not eat. Now, why is that happening? It's because those diets, they have a value system. Oh, other thing, you, there's actually like glutenfreesingles.com. I want if, if anyone has been on a date off of glutenfreesingles.com, please find me. But the reason that this is happening is because these diets carry a value system with them, and people are finding their tribes based around those value systems. The takeaway here is that what you eat, it's not about diet anymore. It's about who you are, what you care about, and how others see you. And I'm going to go over time. 
So the last one here is purpose. Okay. Um, so once you've satisfied those needs, right, there's, there's a desire to figure out what your life is all about. And actually using Google Trends, I found that uh, purpose and finding meaning, the search term has skyrocketed since 2014, which is really interesting. Right, but people are looking for personal growth and peak experiences. Now, meaning can come in a lot of different ways. We all know this, right? Like, we're not all going to be Bill Gates. Sometimes you find meaning in really, really simple experiences. When I stare at my screen, I become introspective and daydream of joining a farming collective. So again, to Michael's research, young people are looking for experiences. They're not buying things in the numbers that our parents' generation did or Gen Xers did. Right? They want to turn every single moment into a memory, into something that's meaningful, where they're developing a new skill, where they're having a memory that they're going to have with other people. They're also buying food that feels meaningful. They are putting their money where their mouths are, literally. I just saw a stat last week that young people feel that they can have more of an influence on the world by buying certain brands than they do from voting. Another really elemental part of this is that many people think that this generation's overstimulated, and in reality, we're drastically understimulated. Right? So people, we're, think about it, we're sitting a lot of the day, we're looking at our screens, maybe the only things that are stimulated are your fingertips, your eyes. Well, it turns out that number one, looking at pictures of food or reading words associated with food stimulates your gustatory and olfactory cortexes. And People today want something that they can actually see and taste and feel. To me, this is part of the um, attraction of meal kits. Right? So number one, it's, it's satisfying the need for um, time management. Right? Going to a grocery store, a lot of people find anxiety inducing. Looking for recipes, people find anxiety inducing. But they still want to cook. They still want to chop the onion themselves. They want to feel and taste and smell as it goes from sharp to sweet in the pan. They want to hear the sizzle, right? A lot of what you're seeing today, I mean, look at the wellness trends in general. This is about reconnecting with your body and your mind and coming back to, oh, right, I'm human. With the rise of digital, we're seeing a return to the analog. People wanting to go back to our hunter-gatherer roots in a way that meshes with the digital age. So people are cooking, they're gardening. Interestingly, uh, edible seed sales are highest among millennials, which doesn't make any sense when you consider that we don't own our own houses. People are really starting to do these things. There's a foraging club near me in Brooklyn. Like, anyway, what people want today is they want environments, they want brands, they want foods that support their individual identities that help them meaningfully connect with others, that create a sense of purpose in their lives, whether that's big or small. So I hope what you can take away from this is, again, the importance of focusing on what are our core human needs. How are the foods and the food environments that we're creating helping people facilitate a sense of safety, of control, of love and belonging, and of purpose and meaning in their lives? So thank you for being a great audience. That was delightful. I, I was paying slightly less attention for 30 seconds because I was frantically looking for how to buy your book. That was, that was my favorite presentation on why I do the things I do. That was awesome. Um, our next speaker is Gerd Lanhard. Um, I already called him out earlier as somebody I'm very excited to hear speak. Um, he's a futurist and travels around the world um, speaking about what everything will look like in the future. And I am very excited by the fact that, among other things, he's talked about music, automobiles, communication, things that are not food, because it is going to be so great to have a break from the food futurism echo chamber. So everybody, Gerd. All right. Thanks very much. Great pleasure to be here today. I live in Switzerland, allegedly the most, one of the most happiest countries in the world, and the most productive. 
which is interesting. How could you be both? But um, I used to live right here in San Francisco for 17 years, and I have a my background is in digital music, and you know, I come from the music business. And as I was listening to uh, to the other speeches, I was already thinking one thing that's really important to realize is that as technology is making our world more efficient, right, everything is becoming technology. It's all about efficiency and you know transcending humanity, as some people would say. Food seems to be the opposite, right? I mean, humanity is the opposite, really. It's inefficient, making mistakes, changing our minds, making up stories, lying. You know? In many ways, you could say humanity is kind of the opposite of technology. Huh? So food strikes me as a very human thing. It's not something we could, in theory, replace food by just having nutrients piped into us. I mean, that already works. Somebody in Silicon Valley will probably invent it soon. That's right before the end of dying. So what I do as a futurist, you know, I don't predict the future. I observe the future. It's very important to keep in mind that uh, some people were capable of predicting the future. Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov, what I do is really observing. And you know, the last couple of years, I, uh, everywhere I speak, I get the question about what is going to happen to humans in a world that is essentially a giant machine. Good and bad things, of course. So I wrote this book. Most of you have a free copy already. We do have more outside. And of course, limitless supply on Amazon. Just kidding. <laughs> so if you're looking at this, basically what's happening today is that we are changing dramatically right, towards a time when we could, in theory, kind of become technology. It's quite clear we're going to change more the next 20 years than the previous 300 years. And that's not an overstatement. Next 20 years, end of oil, right? brain-machine interfaces, possibly the singularity, as it's been called, right? uh, human genome editing, desalination of water, solar energy, self-driving cars. Right? I mean, that's just a, an excerpt. Basically, this world, you know, I live in Switzerland now, so I use the cows, uh, the connected cows. But basically, in this world, everything is being connected. Everything. Uh, Cisco says roughly 700 billion connected devices in five years, including our food. And anything to do with the food. Which leads, as you may have guessed, to efficiency. Efficiency is the holy grail. You know, I can't tell you how many companies that I work with, large companies, their primary goal is to use technology to make the company more efficient, and fire as many people as possible. Because, you know, people are expensive and, of course, they're also trouble. So it's a, it's a good move. When we look at our future, of course, we know this curve has been around for a long time. The exponential curve, not new. But here's what's new about this today. We're actually at the takeoff point of this curve. You know, when I first lived in Silicon Valley, I started a bunch of music companies. I tried something like Spotify in 1999. You know, didn't work. But that's because we weren't ready. I mean, we're at the takeoff point, exponential curve, 18, 24 months, 4, 8, 16, 32. Seven steps to 128, 30 steps up the curve, 1 billion. The kids of my kids will live in such a different world, it's hard to imagine even Blade Runner 2047 wouldn't hit it in the reality scale. The kids of my kids will not know how to drive a car, they, they will not know what a CD or a DVD is, or a book, for that matter. That's kind of sad, because I write books. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe they'll, they'll, uh, they can see it on a visor somewhere. But the important part about this is that this future is not just exponential, which is difficult for us with our linear brain. Right? It is also combinatorial and interdependent. That means all these trends are coming together. The future of food is going to mean cloud computing, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, right? smart cities, smart farming, I mean, just stack them on. Mind-boggling. And I think it's 90% positive. You know, I, I say to many of my audiences who have uh, increasingly have future angst, you know, anxiety about the future, the future is better than we think. We just have to keep it in check. We just have to say, well, really what we want is for that to remain human. And this is where food comes in. I'm a hobby chef. I love cooking. 
And you know, because I work on so many ephemeral things, you know, constructs of the mind, then when I get to cooking, I have to actually eat what I cook, you know, within two hours. That's a great new thing. I think that difference really comes out when you think about the future of food. As I was preparing for this audience and for this talk, and I looked at my book and I identified these mega shifts that I have in the book, right? There's also a, 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 a tiny website called megashifts.com where you can look at those. But that's all the stuff that's impacting food. Digitization. Intelligization, which means turning stuff into intelligent data. Disintermediation, right? Amazon Fresh. I'll give you some examples. So in this world of the mega shifts, there's first two things. We can, for example, scan food now and find out what's in it. So every food source has turned into data. Right? That's called datafication. We can use it to cognify what's around it by using the Internet of Things. We can 3D print stuff. This has been a joke for a long time, you know. It's kind of working, but, you know, who wants to eat 3D printed pizzas, right? But it's actually happening now, right? You can, you can print bread. You can print organic substances. The first consumer companies are looking at printing ice cream on the beach. Custom printing in a box rather than shipping it. This intermediation, this is a vast trend in food, of course. Everybody else can go in the middle. Personalized food. Nestle is very heavy into this. I mean, that is a definitive future scenario. I see a huge business and also a great opportunity. Hopefully, it will not be done by the same people who are putting the pesticides in our food. And automation, of course, in the farms. And, well, you can hardly call that food, I guess, but in fast food restaurants. Uh, this is the first discussion about fast food restaurants becoming 100% automated. So there's one person that unlocks the place and everything else is, you know, the food will be even more fantastic, I suppose, uh, when that happens. So as a futurist, I'd love to ask the question, what if? This is where I go back to the cows. I looked at this for a long time. I did some tasting the other day. I'm pretty amazed, you know, I think Richard Branson is with the program when he says that basically we can get to that place where we can have cultured meat, not replacing meat, but, you know, creating a different food source. Right now, I think it's $2,000 for a pound. Kind of expensive, you know, an expensive cultured meat burger, right? But in five years, so can you imagine a post-meat ecosystem? I think that's not that far away. It probably won't be post-meat, but it will be on top of meat, I suppose. But this will solve many major problems about food. And it's not just meat. Right? We're going into the world of abundance, as many colleagues, futurists have said. Right? Things become possible post-meat, post-oil, post-the-pill, medication, pharma, right? beyond the pill, as they like to say. Because technology is creating abundance. So in this world, this is the shift that we're seeing today. I use it as a symbol. You know, right now, 84% of the world's energy is coal, oil and gas, and nuclear. And, you know, this country is going backwards by going back to more gas. You know, it's an interesting move, but won't last because the future is quite clear. You know, we have to think hybridly. In 20 years, solar energy will be able to supply pretty much all of the energy needs in the world. Then we do things like vertical farming. Desalination of water will become the new normal. Right now, it's so expensive, you can hardly touch it. In 20 years, it could be like Spotify. Basically, a subscription to water, you know, abundant water. Solar energy, that's going to change farming, is going to change what we do as humans with machines. We have new relationships with machines. We speak to our machines. Some people fall in love with their machines. Robots become the new normal, as cheap as we can imagine. We trust our lives to cars. You know, as I was driving down Highway 1 today, I was thinking, out if I had a self-driving car, would I let it take charge? And the answer is definitely not. I mean, I, you know, that seems kind of a stretch, you know. Uh, yes, in a city, in a traffic jam, yes, but, you know, we have machines helping us with our diet, identifying things, you know. But in many ways, it also seems like we're going to be outsourcing some thinking to those machines, you know, using 
virtual experiences, and ultimately, of course, the end of death. Changing our human genome so we can live to be 120, that seems to be within reach in the next 20, 30 years. That is a pretty amazing step forward. Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing, the end of dying? So, really what's happening in computing now, you've noticed, of course, we have moved in this food chain from the tabulating to the programmed machine, and now we're in the cognitive computing era. Machines that can think. And this, of course, the holy grail of Silicon Valley at AI, thinking machines. Of course, these machines don't think like we do. Well, they think like machines do, but they're still very useful. So we're going to a world that machines can hear us, they can see us, they can understand us, and they're no longer programmed. Imagine what difference that will make for food. Recommending things, finding new things, connecting to others. But also a sense of maybe abdicating what I am, giving control to Alexa. I mean, it's fine if you say, Alexa, I need more you know, sticky notes. But you know, what should I eat tonight? Should I have this baby or not, Alexa? <laughs> should I vote? Should I have you vote for me? What is intelligence? Well, it's the ability to accomplish complex goals. We all have that, and we don't even talk about it. Artificial intelligence are computer systems who can sort of do human tasks. Of course, they certainly can't eat. They don't really exist. Right? Remember that movie, Her? At the end of the movie, the guy finds out she has 3,650 other lovers at the same time. Right? Machines don't have a body. As every psychologist knows, humans don't think with their brain. Right? We think with our body. Right? We're much beyond this. So this whole fear of artificial intelligence, this idea of what we do with artificial intelligence, as we've seen with, with in this movie that you all know, right? this is far away from reality. This is Hollywood. The best thing we can do is to ignore everything we see from Hollywood when thinking about AI. Right? It's a fear generator. Not that we shouldn't have fear, you know, well-placed fear, of course. Right? But this current anxiety, this is really AI now. Right? It's cars that can drive themselves. They're, not, they're as dumb as a toaster right? when it's not about driving a car. But they can do that pretty well. Right? They can do the warehouses. Right? They can be robots in, in warehouses doing things. They can, you know, this is Google Lens. They can understand what we're seeing. But, you know, a human doing the same thing sees 5,000 things at the same time compared to Google Lens. Right? I mean, we're, we're so far beyond this primitive understanding of saying, yes, it's a, it's a meat shop or something. Right? I mean, we see all of this. Right? So I think there's very useful things. I love this one. This is the first bot that replaces lawyers. Sorry if any lawyers are allegedly, right? So with this bot, it's called Do Not Pay. Right? Uh, you can fight parking tickets or get an airline to re reimburse you. Right? Uh, it works really well. It's done several hundred thousand parking tickets refutes already. So give it a try. I mean, this is what AI does on the, on the bottom level. That brings me to the important question of the evening. How computable are we? I mean, this is the key question for food, right? In Silicon Valley and in China and many places where technology rules, the belief is essentially that we are fancy machines. We are fancy technology. It's just very hard to figure out how we work. That's the argument, right? And thus, our destination is to become technology, merge with technology, singularity, transhumanism, well, when you think about it that way, we don't need food. Why would we bother? Because, you know, it's just a machine that needs, you know, juice, electric power, right? But I really think what's happening is this, right, in terms of intelligence. Human intelligence has social intelligence, emotional intelligence, some of us at least. Intellectual intelligence, we know things. And then there's a big gap, and then the machines come in, right? Machines are on a whole different level of intelligence. It's narrow. Right? 
It's zeros and ones, but a trillion of them. It's extremely powerful, very useful, potentially dangerous, but it's far from human. So what all that has to do with food, of course, is a critical question, right? A machine would never understand this. What is the value of how we're getting together? Why we're wasting our time preparing, you know, taking on nutrients, so to speak, right? That's what makes us human. It's like relationships, you know, like things that we just do. My colleague, Dr. Johnny Forridi, is an AI, an AI researcher, says, algorithms outperform humans when it is not about any of the human things. Understanding, intentions, self-awareness, interpretations. We should keep that in mind. Do not let the machines do any of these things. There's plenty of jobs for machines to do things that we can't really do. Like, you know, let them fly an airplane for all I care. I do not want the machine to decide who I'm going to date, whether I have children or not based on my DNA, where I should go next, what I should think of, and what is in my newsfeed. So those are all things that really matter to me. I think ultimately the idea of the machine going inside of our brain and duplicating us is both far-fetched and also kind of, you know, it's a far cry from what we can do. So really in the end it comes down to a few things that I want to share with you. First, this is the inevitable future. We are linear. We are organic. We do stupid stuff. We don't understand things. We can't scale. We have to actually sleep and eat. Machines beat us hands down starting just about now. And when the singularity arrives, roughly, I think, 10 years, the point in time when a computer has the capacity of the human brain, we are hopelessly behind. That's why we should never compete with machines on the ground of machine work, routine, tasks, zeros and ones, yes and no's. Imagination is more important than knowledge, quoting Einstein. Of course, easy for him to say, he was a very knowledgeable person. <laughs> but think about this, right? Food, travel, experiences, relationships, consciousness, whatever that is, that's inherently human. And it is human because it's also inherently inefficient. Let's not waste our time in making everything efficient. Yeah? Let's make efficient what we can. Distribution, waste, production. You know, but let's not make efficient what should be inefficient, which is enjoyment, relationships. You know, I'm a musician, producer. I spent 10,000 hours learning the instrument, and I still didn't really master it. But, but now you can buy an iPad and be a musician in 10 hours, right? That's not a bad thing. It's, but it's a simulation. Some simulation in itself is not a bad thing. But let's not confuse it with reality. Let's make sure that we actually know the difference. That food isn't digital, cooking isn't an app, and enjoyment isn't code. And humans aren't machines. That's why food is so crucial. One of the crucial things that we need to hold on to. This is our fundamental challenge ahead of us. Machines will capture our left brain half, right? Well, left brain, brain, right brain stuff is really no longer accurate, but Let's say the logical stuff, right? The routine, the algorithms. Computers will learn how to do all of that, eventually. Will they be right? No, but you know, we're going to give up jobs like bookkeeping, low-level financial advice, driving a car, flying an airplane, cooking a fast food hamburger. So then for us, the question is, do we want those machines that have infinite power manipulate our power. Great example just the last few days, right? Who would have thought that the, pla that the platform for friendship has become a platform for man manipulation? Because of the nature that it's built in, not by evil intent, right? at least not most of it. But $75 million would go a long way to do that. So here's a key question that we have to ask. Right? The temptation will be to automate everything because it's so efficient, including the cooking, the growing, right, vertical farming, the GMOs. 
The question I'm asking is what should not be automated? What should not be connected? What should not be smart? That's a key question. I'm all for efficiency and automation and you know, technology in general, but there's a few things I wouldn't want to automate. I can do without driving a car, that's very un-German to say, but I can, you know, let the cars take over. But decision making, political appointment, there's, there's already a software that decides on probation, whether somebody gets to go out of probation or not. Those are questions that we have to ask. That leads me to what I call digital ethics. You know, I'm sure you're familiar with this, that uh, given that you, you live in this part of the world, all great technology is hell ben, you know, hell and heaven. Technology is morally neutral until we use it, says William Gibson. And God knows, you know, we use it everywhere now. Everywhere. And technology is more powerful than oil and gas and banking and everything together. The technology business makes more money than the banking business and the oil business. Check out uh, DNA modification, human or otherwise. CRISPR-Cas9, the technology that allows you to modify genes, widely used already for animals and organisms. This is the very definition of hell then. It could be great, it could be terrible. It's not per se bad, it's just tech, right? But how do we work this out? Oop. All right, so that looks interesting. But anyway, the cows that don't have horns right? and the mushrooms that don't go bad when you touch them. Now we have an interesting image there. And the CRISPR technology that's becoming kind of like a, a war, you could say. Right? This technology that actually makes us think about this as, as a competition. So there's a bit of an arms race going on, and how do we, how do we define this? You know, who, who decides? The merger of Bayer and Monsanto is an interesting example of hell then. Yeah? Would it mean a rapid improvement there? Will they be in charge of a sustainable food ecosystem? I would say that's pretty unlikely. Yeah? Like put Facebook in charge of privacy globally? I'm <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Not to compare the two, right? Uh, never, ever. But here's the key question I would have. You know, do we need an EPA for humanity? I mean, the EPA has been basically abolished in this country, uh, you know, thanks to Washington and, you know, Mr. Trump. But maybe we need a, a protection agency for humanity, which includes food, enjoying food, being inefficient, doing things that machines can't do. When you think about what's happening on the internet, you know, we're now connecting everything, the internet of things. Right? This is vast for agriculture. I mean, in the agricultural business, if this works, we're talking about 60% less energy, less work, more efficiency, bigger output. And that's all with G without GMOs even. Right? Just making the process better. Mind-boggling, right? we're essentially building a new meta-intelligence, a new nervous system. You can bet that whoever is in charge of that nervous system, yeah. are they accountable? Who are they exactly? What are their ethics? Bertolt Brecht once said, you know, dinner first, then morals. Okay. Now we've had the dinner and now we're thinking about what is actually going to happen. Who's in control? Who's accountable? Right? Where is this going? You've heard from, uh, you know, since this is a food event, I figured I would use this, right? Mark Andreessen, software is eating the world, and indeed it has. Films, television, books, music, cars, money, banking, blockchain, this goes on. Right? Eat, eat, eat. But maybe uh, there's also another issue. Right? Maybe software is also now cheating the world, not just eating it. By making us look at things that are not so by realizing that actually the world is quite different than what the algorithm told us. Or by saying that it knows everything but actually knows nothing. Like human resources analytics. That is a very important point, I think, in our future. And when everything is connected, all agriculture, the entire food ecosystem, when it's hyper-connected, that will be a huge benefit and that is going to happen. But it will still be human. 
Can we put the human back inside? Do we have room for the things that make us human? I think that's a question I have. You know, we, we shouldn't adore technology because it will make it all work so beautifully efficient. The smart converter, McKinsey says, making businesses smart, $62 trillion business. We have a joke among futures. We say, okay, you want to have the next keynote, just put smart in front of it, right? Smart city, smart farming, smart government, even smart banking. Uh, that's the future. But it should not result in dehumanization. Now, we should not use smart systems uh, to make us less capable. That would be ridiculous, right? We'd go backwards on what we want to do. This is what's happening, for example, with jobs. I mean, people are talking about extinct jobs every day now. You just, you know, wherever you look, basically it's the end of work, right? But I wouldn't be so sure. This question pops up all the time. Are humans the horses of the digital age? You know what happened to horses. We still have horses, but you know, they're basically meaningless. Yeah. <laughs> Useless humans. I don't think that will be the case. In fact, I think we can easily say anything that can be digitized or automated will be. That is the nature of technology. Right? I mean, that's what technology does. It's a tool. But the flip side is also very true. Anything that cannot be digitized or automated becomes extremely valuable. And that's where food comes in. Food is about all the things and eating, about all the things that we can't actually define why it's so important. Empathy, emotions, imagination, what I call the Andrew rhythms in my book. You know, not, not the algorithms, but the, the Andrew rhythms. And that is what we have to protect from over-efficiency. That is where we have to say, well, you know, do we need other rules to figure out? Like this restaurant in Washington, D.C. was highly praised for a long time. It's called Eatsa, Eat as A. And it's guaranteed not to have humans in it. Right? That, that was the whole idea. Right? There's no humans involved at all. <laughs> they closed their doors three weeks ago. I think taking humans out of the loop, striving for this, I mean, it's funny, you know, because I speak to a lot of people who use technology, you know, they adore technology for the possibility of increasing margin. It's not about that. Efficiency is for robots. We must go beyond that and create new things, transcend technology. I think in the food business that's crucial because ultimately, a philosopher once said, technology is not what we seek, but how we seek. It is a tool for something. Well, you could say that the tool of everything, of course, is human happiness or contentment or whatever you want to, you know, call it. And that's what food serves also. It's very important that we make that difference, that we don't think of technology as, as something that is a giant machine. Then we end up with this, right? We end up with judgment erosion and bias and reductionism, descaling. In a way, you could say a musician that works on an iPad, after 10 hours, he can do his first gig, you know? That is interesting, but it's also kind of de-skilling, right? Not, not to talk negatively about it, but it's just a different skill, right? And do we lose the other things? Are we abdicating the things that really make us human? Personally, I don't want to be smarter in the future. I don't want to be faster. I want to be more human. I never want to be this, right? just because it will make me faster and I won't need to eat. Obviously, that. Nutrients just come through the pipeline there. Is that our future? I think we have to think hard about this. I think it's going to be important for us to figure out, do we use technology for its good or its bad or for both? Right? I mean, even if you make robots, you can use technology for human purpose. The question is for all of us, how do we position ourselves? And I think food is just now at this point where things are becoming possible like GMO, like CRISPR-Cas9, like 3D printing. So that question stands there right in front of us, and I want to end with the, a uh, riffing off Steve Jobs, rest in peace, who said, stay hungry, stay foolish, which I suppose is the same thing as being human. So stay hungry, stay human, and that fits the purpose of the event, and I want to thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
Hello again. So you might have heard of our next moderator. She is a prolific food writer at the intersection of technology and food. A few places, um, Bloomberg Businessweek, New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, NPR, Wired. But what you might not know is it's not Larissa Zimbaroff, it's Larissa. So please welcome Larissa. Hey guys, um, I, I want to start by echoing what Ali said, which was that the thing that you can do to help this, um, this region is to go out to eat and drink and tell your friends to visit. I visited a winemaker today and he had showed me his Saturday and every visit uh, tour was canceled. So that's what you can do to help. Santa Rosa, Sonoma, Napa, Healdsburg, everywhere. Um, Calistoga, even the places that didn't get hit are lacking in visits. Anyways. Okay, so it is a beautiful day, um, so later we can drink some wine, but I'm going to introduce our first guest, which you, who you already met, which is Ali, but I'll tell you a little bit about him. Um, he's uh, the Chief Science, Science Officer and Co-Founder of Pilot R&D. He has a PhD, one PhD in food biochemistry from the University of Davis, California Davis, um, and he knows his vegetables intimately, which I plan to ask him about later. He did his dissertation on cooking sous vide at the French Laundry. I have a great deal of envy for anybody that gets to do that. Um, and he has a book out, which we'll get to see later, Ingredient, Ingredient Unveiling the Essential Elements of Food, um, which was published last year in 2016. Um, and he, in it, he answers all of our questions, um, from the fancy to the not so fancy questions, um, helping us understand the basic building blocks of food that will make us all better cooks. Um, so I'll introduce Ali, who you already met, but we'll get to talk a little bit more about what he does. Did that music make you ready to science? <laughs> it's going to happen. Um, so thank you, Larissa. Um, Pilot is a company, and our other company, Render is a company, we'll get to this in one second, whose blood pressure did something. Um, our, our stock and trade is uh, taking ideas, making them possible, and then scaling them. We work with companies that are giant multinational companies, and we work with just some guy who got out of finance and is really into beignets. Um, we work with everyone, um, and now through our new company, Render, we also work with like Michelin-starred chefs on coming up with new food products and scaling them. Um, the secret weapon that we use in that endeavor is the uh, subject of the book, but it's, uh, it's called culinary science. Who here has heard that phrase? Who in here is brave enough to hazard a definition out loud? Somebody do it. Yeah. Chemistry, physics, and biology of food together. Um, yes, that could also be used to describe food science, which is this. This is how stuff freezes. This is the science of frozen food, kind of. This is the science of the ice crystals inside of the frozen food. Um, that's actually why we care. <laughs> so um, the reason I'm, I'm like pedantic about culinary science is because I went to food science grad school, which is a delightful place for hope to die sometimes. Um, <laughs> Food science is important. It is the bedrock. It's the foundation. But the foundation isn't sexy, and the foundation isn't meant to move. This is how food scientists are taught to think about frozen food. It's really easy to lose sight of color and hope when this is it. And unfortunately, this has been the story of what it has been up until the past 10 years. Um, there are a lot of really, really brilliant engineers and uh, chemists and microbiologists who have led the charge in food science since World War II. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them just didn't get into Berkeley. I was one of them. I thought I wanted to be a chemist. Um, a lot of the amazing food science that has been done has been done in a way that completely separates it from food. Chances are, if you study starch, you could probably study polysaccharides in something completely inedible, and you would do just fine. And you probably wouldn't care. And that is just the state of that field. Um, 
on the other hand, you have chefs who this is it. This is, this is the whole reason. This is the beginning and the end. Culinary science is uh, bifocals. I call it x-ray vision in the kitchen, right? It's being able to see this and this simultaneously with picture in picture. So when people come to pilot, um, we, we are all hybrids. We're all culinary scientists. Even Dana, who's here, is our CEO. Um, in, in a past life, before really understanding things about um, uh, the business of food, she was a pastry cook at WD-50 in Gramercy Tavern. That we, we are a weird hybrid group. And the whole point is that when people come to us looking for chefs, they're often looking for creative Martians with a secret pantry of silver bullets that will solve whatever problem they have. The number one question we get asked as, with our chef pants and hats on is, what's the new ingredient? What weird cactus did you find in your chef pantry that's going to solve all of our problems? On the food science side, it's what, what magical science do you have that will fix our problem? And all of that is very strange because it's all in search of the silver bullet. The food world, and, and when we're talking about the state of R&D, up until now has all been about finding the silver bullet. What is the starch that's going to solve my potato chip problem? What is the sweetener that's going to allow me to achieve um, Dana's ultimate theory of what all Americans actually want, which is to be told that they can eat as many chocolate chip cookies as they want and it'll be fine? What is, what is the perfect sweetener that's going to allow us to do that? Um, what is the perfect cocktail of isolated aroma compounds that will make carrots taste like bacon? It's, that, that is a problematic way to try to solve food for a lot of reasons. The number one thing is that this is not how food works. Food is not squared off. Food does not have right angles. For you to have a silver bullet means there has to be a perfectly silver bullet sized hole to shoot through. And food is all weird wonky edges. This is what food actually looks like. These are all the things that can be at play when you're trying to figure out um, uh, bottled RTD coffee, or when you're trying to figure out um, what's going on with a hamburger, or when you're trying to figure out how to make the ultimate mac and cheese that you just dump and stir. This is, this is it. This is what's going on. Um, and it can be overwhelming. So what culinary science is and what we are, um, we are people with the creativity of chefs. We all come from running um, R&D kitchens for Michelin-starred restaurants, um, who are propped up with the backbone of science. Because chef creativity can be very Pixar. It can be very floppy and, and irregular and really hard to make specific stepwise progress. So that's where the science comes in. Um, and part of that is in weeding through all of this to do immediate triage on what we need to do to fix a problem. So I'm going to give you two specific examples that are augmented a little bit from reality to protect those involved. Um, so don't go trying to look for the second example, because it will sound delicious, because it doesn't exist yet. Um, <clears throat> When we're presented with a problem, um, like banana bread, uh, we had a client who came to us and they said, we make an amazing banana bread that we're distributing through e-com right now that has a shelf life of five days. It is so sticky. Um, we would like to get it into places like Whole Foods, and they're not really interested if you don't have a shelf life of several months. So we're trying to get it to a shelf life of like six to eight months. They said that they had been engaged with an ingredient company that had sent them like three dozen different perfect thickeners. Was, they, they went through the catalog. They went through xanthan gum and different kinds of cellulose. They went through carrageenan. They went through locust bean gum and then a bunch of other things. And their chef, who was doing great development for them, was unable to get anything to happen. And uh, even some of the trials that they did made their product deteriorate faster. They said, what we would love is for you to take a look at clean label ways to fix our product so that the product that people already love can exist for six to eight months on a shelf. The first thing that we told them was the product that you love, if you choose to go through this door, is dead. It's gone. We're going to strip it for parts. We're going to save what makes it chewy. We're going to save the fact that it's made from real bananas. We're going to save the color. We're going to save a lot of the cues but there is no free lunch. You can't just make, if you want natural food that people feel good about eating, there's no secret alchemy that chefs or scientists have that allow you to have the fundamental law of nature that shit degrades <laughs> be violated, right? So immediately what we did was we took this crazy 
uh, mess of things that's going on in food, and we immediately cut through and we said, these are the things that are going to help us get to that point. These three things. Um, all of the uh, starches and gums and thickeners, that was all in service of messing with how water flows around. So that water um, is less likely to cause staling, it's less likely to cause sugars to crystallize. Um, binding water was really the only way, since this is a baked good that's gonna sit on a shelf, any water that's in that thing that's making it moist and delicious needs to have a dancing buddy, otherwise microbes are gonna come in and they're gonna spoil your food. The other thing was this banana bread was loaded with coconut fat. Coconut fat is delicious until it goes rancid. So we needed to assign that fat a bodyguard. Those were the three prongs that we were gonna work on, but that was never isolated from this swirling whirlwind of everything you have to have in mind when you work with food. So chefs in restaurants, when you're fixing things, chefs never say, ah oh, man, my hollandaise isn't good. What magical thing should I put into it to make it good? They'll try new eggs, they'll try different ratios, they'll get a different person to make it, they'll make it at different times of the day. They'll, your chefs are ruthless problem solvers. And so that's what we tried to bring this. So um, we ended up looking at clean label ways to address each of these. We looked, instead of xanthan gum, we were looking at like citrus fiber and psyllium husk and all of these um, new cleaner label things that are on the market. We looked at green banana uh, flour. Why not? It's got a ton of starch. It hasn't ripened yet, so that starch hasn't turned into sugars. It, there's, there's a lot that that green banana, banana flour can do for us. Um, for binding water, we didn't just look at um, isolated fructose and glucose, we looked at honey. We looked at banana molasses. We looked at all kinds of strange things. And then for the uh, breakdown of ingredients, we looked at rosemary extract and acerola cherry powder and other things that are now gratefully on the market that help keep things from oxidizing that truly just come from, there's a weirdo South American cherry called the acerola that by weight is like 33% vitamin C. So let's use that. <clears throat> Great. We ended up making great strides. We made something that was delicious. Um, it was slightly different, but that was, that was it. <laughs> Either it's gonna be slightly different or it's gonna be slightly scarier. And we always push for food can be delicious in a lot of different ways. And our client was awesome. They were flexible. They were, they were willing to um, go on a journey with us. Another one um, was that somebody wanted to make a smoked prosciutto mayonnaise. Yeah, this is the one that also doesn't exist, so I'm sorry. Um, they wanted to make a smoked prosciutto mayonnaise. They'd engaged a food scientist for like three months to make it happen. Um, that food scientist had spun his or her wheels, and they ended up with something that was just not working. It had to have a million different thickeners in it. It was completely unclean label, and weird stuff was growing on it. Interestingly, this mayonnaise was following the same rules, because when you make an emulsion, things are going to want to try to separate out, right? So we had to rein in water. We had to make sure that fat droplets weren't gonna find each other in a agglomerate. We had to put emulsifiers and thickeners and stuff until we realized, why are we making a mayonnaise? All they wanted was something that tasted like smoked prosciutto that you could spread on toast or saute an egg in. There's no reason we need to make a mayonnaise because prosciutto fat is already solid at room temperature. Mayonnaise is mayonnaise because canola oil is oil, right? You cannot spread oil. We ended up just whipping the prosciutto and saying, hey water, get out. <laughs> taking all of those concerns away and ending up with something here. And that was just because of being able to see and, and triage. We went from a 15 ingredient whirlwind trying to figure out uh, different processing techniques and methods of preserving this thing to something that was very straightforward. So that's how we solve problems. The last thing that I wanna talk about is where ideas come from. And there's a spectrum. That spectrum, by the way, this is the product that we just launched, Render, it's called State Birdseed, comes from Ideas that are food driven, this is the Steve Jobsian side of the spectrum, to uh, food that is concept driven. We, since we started Pilot, I think we've made uh, 20 to 25 different types of nutrition bars. We've made keto, paleo, vegan, high protein, low sugar, all clean label, don't care if you put razor blades in it as long as it doesn't have nuts. We've made it all. And the reason this is sort of the lowest common denominator, and I don't mean that disparagingly, I eat a lot of protein bars because I travel, the reason this is the lowest common denominator is because physically speaking, pro biochemist tip, you can get any amalgam of stuff to stick together and form into a bar. You will never have a uh, 26 gram of protein unicorn croissant because that is some higher order stuff. As long as we are only going off of what the, the market we think it's demanding, 
this is the realm we're going to be in. On this side, who in here is familiar with state bird provisions in San Francisco? So Stuart and Nicole are two of our favorite chefs. Um, they make things crispy in a way that inspires sometimes X-rated dreams. And they had this topping that they put on top of everything from oysters to uh, smoked salmon mousse that we were like, it, it's the thing people say to chefs. If you put this in a bag, people would line up the block uh, to buy it. So we put it in a bag. And the purpose of Render is to take chefs' ideas with whom we are friends and bring them to market with zero market research. That is an unofficial pledge of Render. We're going to make stuff and we're going to dive headlong into it because these are the Steve Jobses of the food world. There's a lot of middle ground in there to play with, but just know that you're always sliding around on this spectrum when you're talking about new food ideas. Last thing is, there is a lot of open space on, on uh, this side of the spectrum because there's no confines. And within that side of the spectrum, the most wide open space is reserved for flexitarians. Please let us fry parsnip chips in bacon fat. We can do stuff with, with tofu and just a little bit of chicken stock that will truly move meat from the center of the plate. Honestly, truly. If, if we're trying to destabilize the industrial farming complex, the best way to do that is with just a little bit of bacon. So anyway, I, I talk too much. Thank you very much. Make sure we get that carrot tastes like bacon recipe before we leave. Um, the next, uh, our next speaker is Todd Carmichael. He's the CEO of La Colombe Coffee, which incidentally got me through writing my MFA. Um, Carmichael is passionate about where his beans come from, how they're roasted, and more importantly, how they're served. To that end, he is looking to change the coffee industry in America. Um, I'm going to let him tell you about that, but I've got to say he's got a really clean label, and I was really impressed. Hey, okay. Hey. How can, can we get that up there? Oh, look at that. My Madonna mic just turned on. Uh, so I guess my role here is uh, I'm your token analog uh, speaker. Uh, of course, as it goes with analog people, I follow the brilliant and vaguely, he had that vague European accent guy with the suit, and then the PhD and the writer, and I think they have... Katy Perry and uh, Madonna after me. Um, but I do have slides. There you go. My slides, they're in digital form. Um, I guess um, what I should say also as your analog speaker is I'm, uh, I'm here because I'm, uh, I don't want to horrify you. Uh, the future isn't just made of computers. And it just isn't made of software. And those kind of things that we can't always see coming. Actually, the fu uh, future is full of food, and food, at the end of the day, at the, the core of it, and not to argue with the MC because he's brilliant, is analog. And how big is it? You know, I, I just heard earlier today that, you know, the digital world, it's just growing. It's, how, how do you say it was uh, moving along some graph that I don't understand because, but I have slides up here. <laughs> um, the, uh, the analog world is pretty big too. I mean, think of this. Just in CPG, consumer packaged goods, you know, that's grocery stores, that's natural, traditional club. Americans pull one trillion pounds of food and beverage off shelves every year. That doesn't include the things that they eat at restaurants or in cafeterias or at school. One trillion pounds, and that's doubled up by the rest of it. So that's two trillion pounds. I'm not really sure how much a pound of food is, but I think it's probably over a dollar. So that's a fairly big market. And when you look at it, and when I look at it from a critical eye, I realize, this is a little farm guy from a place called Spokane, Washington, that the, the, the companies that fed my uh, father and my mother and my grandfather are not feeding my children. So two or three trillion dollars. And let's, let's get real, after three zeros, I don't even know what the number is. That's how big trillion is, right? That that is quite an evolution. In fact, that evolution is so fast that I think we should put an R in front of it, right? So that's a bit of a food or analog revolution. And Silicon Valley, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates had really very little to do with it. The people who had something to do with it, sometimes food scientists, or sometimes little guys like me who practice science without a license. 
It is chefs who do the very same thing. In fact, it's maybe due to the millennials or just the fact that we all know a little bit more about our food. When I left the farms in 82 and I went to Seattle, I, if I would have seen an olive garden, I'd have lost my mind. Look, Italian food, right? Now, those years have kind of come and gone, and now I, even me, have learned a little bit, the analog guy, about food. And then I look around and I realize, at the core of the analog existence, that every single living organism on the planet Earth has the same burden, whether you're an amoeba or maybe some bacteria in my gut or a honey badger or some kind of tuna or even, you know, you and me. We've been put here with a singular burden, that is to evolve. Now, most of us, or the, let's say the organisms outside this room, the way they evolve is they commingle their DNA with somebody else and they just hope for the best, they die, and maybe they evolve that way. But humans have a very special burden, is that we evolve throughout our lives. We learn, and we learn new tools, we learn new things, and we, as a person, as a human, we evolve along with our food and with our beverages. And what does that mean? I mean, look around you. I guess, uh, let me back up a second. I guess what I'm driving at is, I think it was in the 80s, some of you were back, back <laughs> alive back then, there was this guy named Gordon Gecko. And Gordon Gecko said something, he said, you gotta be growing or you're dying. Dude, does anyone remember that? Like, as a company, you're growing or you're dying? That's not true at all, it's complete bullshit. No, no, that's crap, right? Because look at, again, the honey badger. Funny enough, it used to be the size of a bear but it evolved downward because it needed to adapt and evolve. And it became rugged. It, it, it learned skills that made it survive to this day. The honey, don't fuck with the honey badgers is what I'm trying to get at. The, but the, point, <laughs> the point is, as a company that's making food, ultimately, it's not about getting bigger. It's about learning how to adapt to your environment. It's about being a scientist or being that organism that that learns as it goes and changes as it moves forward. It's not about becoming the biggest company in the room. It's about being that company that, that takes food or the things to the next level, which is ultimately all of our jobs. Now, what does that say? So, let me give you a little background. So, I left the farms in 1982, and I went to Seattle, and no one would give me a job in a restaurant because I wasn't qualified to talk to people or serve them, <laughs> and, and that's, I mean, maybe if Olive Garden was around, I could have, could have got a job. So I ended up finding this job in this warehouse. And I looked in, there was this bay door, and I looked inside, and, they, and I saw guys dragging these grain sacks around. And I went, well, I know how to do that. I've done that my whole life. So I asked them for a job, and they said no. And so I came back like a farm boy the next day, did that for a couple weeks, so eventually someone didn't show up. And they said, okay, uh, skinny little kid, it's your turn. And when I got in there, I looked at these grain sacks, and they had names on them, like Rwanda, and like, Burundi and Uganda and like Tanzania and Brazil and Peru and Guatemala and it was just the most fascinating wheat I'd ever seen. Oh, it wasn't wheat. It was it was coffee, right? And I fell in love with the notion that that this grain had come from faraway places. And then I saw a little coffee roaster, and I understood that because it was electricity, it was gas, it was welded metal, and it was it was it was this combination of agricultural products and mechanics. And that was just the most fascinating thing I'd ever thought of in my life. You apply heat to this. So I worked and it worked, and eventually, you know, I ended up on this roaster, and it was about eight, I guess it was like 83, 84. And they would just ask me, you know, get it as dark as you could and don't turn it on fire. I mean, that was pretty much how I, how I roasted. That was how I'd, and I would, I would do that, and it would like stick to the inside of a pan. And I became so fascinated with this, this thing called food. And for me, that grain represented the rest of food. Somehow it, it touched this whole world that, that I'd never really experienced before. This guy came along named Howard, and he bought it. The, the company was called Starbucks. They had three cafes at the time. And I realized they wanted me to stand. I realized that I couldn't because I really didn't know anything about roasting. I'd been roasting for a couple of years. I mean, no one really did in America. Now, back then, Europe made the best cheese, we have to admit, right? Best butter. Butter is still, a lot of times, the best butter. Best wine at the time. I mean, Napa Valley was coming up. But the best beer, the best coffee. They made everything great. 
So I left for Europe, and I spent two years there, and then I, I learned how to profile right, and I became curious about home again, about the farms. And I realized, I remember back in the days, because I grew fruit, that the guy who took the time to take a truck, or the woman that came to take a truck up the farm, I'd always make sure they got the best stuff. I'd always take them to the best part of the farm, and you know, if they came to see us, I'd walk them around. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do this thing that didn't exist at the time. I wanted to take the farms to America. That was my idea. So in 1993, I started a little coffee roasting company. And when I kicked the door open in 93, I had this beautiful coffee from Jürgen Schäfe and then had some other African coffees, one from Brazil. And I had $200 in my pocket. And it was pretty much make it or break it. And I guess the company was worth about $200 at the time. <laughs> or so, and I wanted to sell coffee. So I went up and I went to a guy named Georges Perrier. Does anyone remember Georges Perrier? And a guy named Laurent Moric from the Peacock Alley. Alan Ducasse, come on, people, work with me. Jean-Georges, so I picked the top 10 French chefs because I knew the French people would listen to me because they, I mean, I didn't, I talked like I do now, right? I was, in, you know, incoherent. And, and then all I had to do was really make him a cup of coffee and I'd be golden, right? So those are my first, first foray into uh, roasting coffee for other people. And what I realized is that they were R&D people. For the next two years, I watched them. I just watched how they looked at things, the way they handled a piece of meat, the way they would experiment before. And I looked at them and I asked them, I said, what kind of scientific degree do you have? And they just laughed. I mean, most of them didn't finish high school. They slept in their cars in their first gigs in Lyon, right? And, but they were the most brilliant men in the world. And it was Alain who told me, he goes, I, yeah, I, I practice science without a license. And at that point, that's when I realized that's what I wanted to be. It was 1997, and someone came into the cafe and asked the most impossible thing. And they go, could I get the uh, iced latte? Oh, no, yeah. A latte on ice. Now, let me just translate what this sounded like back then. They said, can I get a piping pot, hot pint of beer? You know, it was like, it was so insane to me that someone would want to have coffee, which is a hot beverage, on ice. It was just the weirdest thing I ever heard of. So I thought maybe he'd been hit by a car, or that he, was, he was overdosing, there was still something bad going on. I made it for him, I heard him come in, and then a couple times back, but winter, it went away what, six, seven years later, we were doing over 50% of all of our coffee in our 30 cafes across the United States were cold. This summer, it was 68%. It is now the dominant way of having coffee. Three years ago, I started looking at it, and I was thinking about Alain, and I realized that I'd fallen down on the job. I messed up. When that first person asked for a nice latte, I didn't give him a nice latte. I was missing one of the ingredients, the key ingredients, the driver of everything that a latte is about. Concentrated coffee, right? Double espresso, espresso. Milk, real milk, hopefully, you know, just recently from the cow. And the third ingredient is vapor. Vapor, vapor, it's texturized. What you do is you vaporize, you heat up water, it's water vapor. And when you make a cold drink, you can't use water vapor because obviously that would just turn to water. So you have to figure another way of putting vapor into a cold latte. It's, mi it's missing the key element. And it was that point that I thought, then I started losing my sleep and I went to work on it. What I wanted to do is I wanted to do what I saw Alain do. I wanted to do what I saw all my heroes, from Thomas to Eric Ribert to all of them. They were the scientists, so I went to work on my science. And I started thinking about it, and I saw some shaving gel. I know, right? So that's all I have to say. Thank you. No. The, so I saw some shaving gel. <laughs> I know. I, that's why I'm analog. You're not, you're not going to know where I'm going. Can't predict it. No scientific equation. That can, um, it, it had a valve at the bottom of it. Right? So if you look at the bottom of a shaving gel, that gel, how does it get out of the can? There's no fluorocarbons. What they do is there's a valve and they put pressure on it. And I realized, oh my God, yeah, there's, a can can have a valve. 
And then I was looking at a tank on the back of a forklift. It was a, you know, a fuel tank. And I, it occurred to me that that's vapor, that's a liquid. And as soon as you open the valve, the liquid becomes a vapor. So theoretically, if I grab this air here, ah, I compressed it, I've got liquid in my hand. And if I release it, it's vapor. And so I invented the, the draft latte. So the draft latte is this. Concentrated coffee, do I have a picture of it? Oh, that's uh, some geisha from Panama, it's a beautiful thing. The um, concentrated coffee, water, valve at the bottom of a can. You take nitrous oxide, you compress it into a liquid, and then you inject it into the can. It stays a liquid as long as it's under pressure. Turn around, when you open the can, that liquid nitrous, nitrous oxide becomes vapor. So we built a factory in, in, in New York, and now, I guess, what was the last numbers, I guess? We're, we, we do about 185,000 cases a week now. And that's, we launched it seven months ago. We've toughed off a little revolution, just in the analog way, by being a scientist with no idea what he's doing, by looking at shaving gel and a forklift, and just looking at something critical. When I look back now, I know I missed all those years. I, the biggest breakthrough isn't finding the solution. It's finding what's missing. It's, it's finding the problem. See, once you find the problem, you'll be amazed how quickly you can unwind. Okay, okay, the banana bread, I can't nail that one. But I'm just saying, <laughs> the, the, the problem is the biggest problem, knowing what it is. When you look across a landscape and you see loads of buildings, it's easy to see the buildings, but it's hard to see what buildings should be in that landscape. And ultimately, it took those years for me to figure that out. One of the greatest success stories for me is one of my best friends. Okay. He is another sci guy who practices science without a license, and he's quite, quite successful. Uh, he's insanely analog. I've just pretty much explained to him how to text, and he'll actually call me to explain how to text again. Uh, he was a herdsman up in, uh, up in the mountains in Europe, and he uh, came to America because he's like me. Uh, he's a pinko progressive snowflake, and he wrote a bunch of things that his government didn't like. So they, they forced him out of the country, and he ended up in New York, and he tried to drive a cab. Now, if you knew him, you'd realize that's a really bad vocation because he really can't handle driving, you know, even like for himself. And so he ended up getting fired. And so he, he goes to up to upstate New York and starts making cheese. And then he realizes what's missing in America. It's Greek yogurt. And this little guy names his little company Chobani. He was up on the screen earlier. Another analog guy. Ultimately, he knew how to make yogurt, but it took him a while to know what was missing. So I guess my... My, uh, my, my whole thesis is this. Analog is still here. The digital world will not replace analog. It won't replace those people who work with their hands, who know how to craft things, who care, who go to the end of the world to make sure that, that people get and deserve, get what they, you know, that, that <laughs> what they should have and get what they deserve, and then ultimately, those, the, the, the world belongs to those who can recognize what is missing. If it can happen to a guy like me, or it can happen to a guy like Hamdi Ulakaya, you know, two simple guys with analog minds from farms, then just imagine what you could do with it. My name is Todd. That's all I got. Todd brought his coffees, so make sure you get one later. Like I said, they're excellent. Um, we're going to shift now. Our next talk speaker is Ellie Truesdell from uh, Whole Foods. Ellie has been with Whole Foods for nine years, working her way up from her first job in the Westport, Connecticut office to the, uh, be the Northeast Forager. Um, today, she's the Global Director of Local Brands and Product Innovation, a role that gives her the front row seat to creating new products for consumers and simultaneously getting to see them hit big. Um, she basically has the ultimate job because she gets to try every snack before we've seen it. 
Here's Ali. Thanks. All right, am I on? Hi, guys. Um, so Todd was the, kind of the perfect layup for me because I'm also going to be very analog. I've been super impressed by the research and data that we've seen on the screen so far. But um, given the intro you just heard about my role at Whole Foods for the majority of my nine years, the local forager position, I've been really responsible for working very, very closely and hands-on with a ton of small emerging food companies, whether those are growers, actual farmers, um, entrepreneurs, or manufacturers. I've worked cross-category for a number of years, and so I just have a, a lot of anecdotes to share, a lot of experiences, and um, they're really not, not very connected to data, and there's not a ton of research behind them. It's just very instinctual and connected to food in a way that I think we're hearing a lot about from um, a couple of people, that the future of food is food. Um, and I feel really lucky to have had that position because um, rather than be a traditional buyer with uh, my head in a spreadsheet all day, I was given license and really my job is to seek out opportunities through relationships and to build really strong relationships with food producers and find, um, find the new next exciting thing because you have the time to do it. You're not just looking at data and you're not just looking at numbers. So um, it's a really interesting role and now um, kind of supporting our local program nationally, I have the chance to work with all of our regions and um, see a little bit more of the most interesting food across the country. So actually when I um, built this presentation, I had not, I've been out here on the West Coast for about two weeks and I've been in the Pacific Northwest for the last week. And so I have a couple of really great stories from that trip that I think is going to serve as um, even better examples of what I had in here. So I'm going to in infuse a little that is not, uh, that doesn't have the slide connected. But um, I think when we think about food products, you know, it's, food is a very specific business. It's actually pretty easy to make food. And for years and years, most people, the way they ate food was to make it at home. So if you're putting a food product on the shelf, it needs to bring tremendous value. And it can be in any number of ways, and I'm going to talk about a couple examples that have been particularly effective. Um, but I think that perspective and distinction and having integrity to your products um, is really, really important at arriving at a certain value. So, um, you know, I think people often see innovat innovation in my title and so expect me to be really excited about the next big thing in tech or the next big thing in um, ag meeting tech. And while that's really important work and I think that finding solutions to some of these really big problems is tremendous, there's also some real value in just putting better food and making better food available to more people. So especially when, you know, I, I work for a grocery retailer, so we're looking for the highest quality food, we're looking for great food, but above anything, we're really still looking for things that are familiar and approachable and simple in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think that it's, you know, that it's not really rocket science, but it's finding those crossover points and those touch points where you can de deliver value on in any number of ways, but getting every single detail right. Um, and these are a couple examples, but I'm going to tell you two quick stories about who I was visiting um, in the Pacific Northwest. I actually I ended up vis visiting about 12 different suppliers and growers, but two really stuck out to me. Um, both because actually they're very analog, but their businesses have seen uh, incredible success. One was um, Seely's Family Mint Farm in Clatskanie. Oregon in the Willamette Valley, fourth generation uh, mint farm who is, has, you know, over the past few years really had to transition their business. They grow over 450 acres of spearmint and peppermint, heirloom mint, um, and they saw the industry really fall out beneath them a few years ago. Colgate and Wrigley's kind of pulled their business from all of the Willamette Valley where they're growing a lot of mint and said, we can get synthetic mint oil way cheaper from abroad where we're not buying from you anymore. So out of necessity, um, the Sealy's just decided they, they had to do something to try to continue to process their mint, make their mint oil, that, and they were really, really convicted that they weren't adding synthetics, they're going to be doing it the way that they've always done it. So they started making peppermint patties and selling them at the Portland Farmer's Market. And um, you, I mean, it's a sort of product that you taste and you're like, I don't know why this is so good, but this is so good. This is the best peppermint patty I've ever had. And so you, so, you know, someone in our, in our company, our local forager in the Pacific Northwest met them, brought them into our stores, their national product. You can find them um, at any time, but also in the holidays, you'll probably really notice them. Um, but they, they're just making the most simple pro product, but 
with kind of the cleanest ingredients, and it's a, it's a farmstead peppermint patty. You're not, you're not finding that in many places. And there's, there was something in meeting them. I mean, they, they produce on their farm. They have a trailer set up where they're uh, manufacturing peppermint patties on their farm, uh, like among the acres and acres of mint. So it's a really cool experience. But I think there was something that struck me that no matter what, there are plenty of people, even maybe many of you have tried that exact product and thought to yourself like, oh my gosh, this is delicious, I'm hooked, I'm gonna buy it again and again, and you didn't even know the story behind it. And I think so often right now, it's uh, a little tempting to get really excited by story and mission and attributes, which of course I'm the number one person to get excited by all of that, but the product has to stand alone and be impactful on its own. So I was really excited to um, have that experience with the Sealies because it's, it's incredible to see, but it's also just standalone, fantastic product. It tastes so good and flavor and quality and um, ingredients are, are really, really important. Um, and a couple other examples I'm gonna use that are pictured um, are just to look at, you know, crossover points of how are you delivering value with a product. I think um, right now, more and more than ever, again, this is for a, a person walking into a grocery store or someone who's buying um, so that they don't have to cook, potentially, or if, if we're talking about consumer product goods. And so I uh, use the example of Brecky on here as a new brand out of San Diego in Southern California, two guys um, formerly with Suja who are starting this company. And um, I think it's, it's really great. It's another example of just really simple overnight oats were something that started to trend a few years ago and people are still certainly making them at home, but there are plenty of people who just don't want to go to the trouble of putting you know, milk over oats um, the night before. It's like amazing to me, but it's, it's very true. So they um, start experimenting with you know, how they can manufacture this and put it in a uh, the equivalent to like a Siggy's cup and sell it. And they have some other great attributes, you know, they're adding amaranth and chia and all sorts of things, but it's a really tasty product, it's affordable, and it's it's simple. It's like you don't have to, even if someone doesn't know the concept of overnight oats, it's still something that's um, really approachable. And, and so far in just their first few months, they're doing incredibly well in our stores. Um, so I wanted to use that as an example of just simplicity, convenience, health, all of those things married in one product um, to success. Uh, seeing our time, I'm just gonna use one more example um, on this, this slide. The other thing is timing. I mean, if when, when Eating Evolved uh, approached me, had someone asked me like, you know, a month before, a few weeks before, if I was planning on um, launching any chocolate brands in the next any time, I would have said no, like, oh, chocolate's so oversaturated. Same with RX bar. I introduced RX bar to Whole Foods and had someone asked me if I was going to introduce a bar, ha having not met them and not having seen their specific value proposition, I've been like, no way. So I think there is something to real recognizing and realizing that even in saturated categories, there's always the opportunity to introduce something new and offer a specific value. And with Eating Evolved, these are um, paleo-friendly coconut cups. Um, they're, you know, kind of like peanut butter cups, but they're with coconut oil. And that met a very specific need at the time. It was right as paleo was taking off and they are delicious, delicious standalone products. So I think timing is really important to keep in mind. Um, I use the same example with, with Sir Kensington's. I mean, they were, they were nine years ago. They brought um, ketchup and mustard and mayo alternatives to the big big brands and gave you a cleaner condiment experience nine years ago. But now, you know, the number of condiments that companies that I've met since then, it's a very different value. It doesn't really have a value in, in that space. So I think those things are really important to recognize if ever you're looking at developing a product or in investing in one, given the audience. Um, so one thing that was suggested to kind of talk about is also just the fact that not, you know, so few products do survive and I think for anyone who's trying to develop a brand or, or look at um, making products should be reminded that I was asked to give some kind of like failure examples but I wanted to, to give some hope so um, I'm just going to talk quickly about two brands that repositioned a little bit and have seen success from they thought they were launching one company and really moved moved over. Um, so the Chot Co. is a savory yogurt company. They launched these yogurt cups um, in a couple of our regions. And you know, yogurt is an incredibly competitive category. So to compete in with a savory yogurt versus a Chobani versus a Siggy's versus a Faye, like forget it, it's it's really hard to do. 
So they, they didn't really succeed there. Um, but in the meantime, they got to know our customers. They were doing a ton of trials. They um, launched a, a cart, like sort of snack um, concept where they were able to just glean a lot of information. And they found that people were really looking for something in a different category in puddings. And um, we really don't have much that's exciting in pudding nationally. And so they're now um, working on products that are really delicious and in an area of the store that really needs attention. And that's something we're super excited about. So they were able to pivot and hopefully we'll see success. Um, and then another brand I think is a great example of this is uh, SAP. It's one of my favorite beverages, and I don't get that excited about beverages. Um, they started with a maple soda product, and I think they pretty quickly realized that like soda, it was not the time to get into the soda game, right? Like there's such tremendous decline. So they um, soon after launched a seltzer product with maple, and soon after that a birch seltzer, which is so delicious, really unusual. Um, and just has like really, I think, cheeky, fun, clever branding, and they've done uh, really, really well. So there's always the opportunity to pivot. Um, this is my last example because we're right at the end of time. This to me just represents a company that's extremely distinctive, really has a perspective, has the integrity and value that I'm talking about. Chocolate Naive is a brand out of Lithuania. Um, this guy, Demontis, is incredibly passionate, knows so much. He's this incredible chocolatier. Um, but not only does he put out incredible chocolate bars with interesting flavors and components and is, you know, working closely with every cacao farm, He's also really playing around with the pulp of the cacao, which I think is something that's really interesting and really hasn't been done before. So there is always the opportunity for innovation in doing something new. But for me, what's most exciting is when you're doing it with ingredients that are familiar, that people love and already really care about, but just reinventing and bringing us something new. Um, so that's that. Thank you. <laughs>we have uh, one more speaker today but um, I do want to say that I tried that birch soda at the fancy food show the the sparkling version and it was really great so it was really nice to see that there was something that came about before that with Ellie um, our next speaker is Amy Shipley she comes to us from Sterling Rice Group um, which is in Boulder Colorado Amy focuses on B&B &B, food service retail and CPG and she's bound to give us a different perspective from what we've been seeing today um, she also gave me this really interesting stat, which I haven't fact-checked yet, which is that Boulder is, more money is spent on startups in Boulder than anywhere else. So I really want to find out more about that. I'm looking forward to hearing her talk. All right, it's true. Good work, everybody. I am the last woman standing between you and a cocktail. So I am terribly sorry. I'm going to keep this really short. Um, amazing speakers today. Thank you, Gal, and just amazing stuff. And that birch packaging, rock on. I have to try that. Um, so here's what I'm going to talk about today. I just want to show you um, a few secrets about how we go about the innovation process at SRG in, in Boulder um, and show you a couple tactics that we use and show you a few products. And there's a couple products I'm going to show you that I probably should not be showing at the CIA, but I'm going to do it anyway. So here's a little bit on us. Um, hey, it's a cool place. Anyone been to Boulder? Come out to Boulder? Yes, rock on. It's a good place. We have snow. Snow is already coming. So for all of you skiers, it's going to be a good season. So come out and see us. We are a branding, innovation, uh, positioning firm, and communications. Um, we're private. We have about 130 people out there. A lot of chefs on staff, a lot of people like me that do innovation work um, that are really, really passionate about food. Boulder is the hub, really, of health and wellness in this country. I spent 23 years living in San Francisco, which is really food forward. And when I moved to Boulder, it's like insane. It's because everybody's a freaking athlete. You know, my, the woman that sold me my home has three gold medals. I mean, that's kind of the environment there. And I think it's insane. So I say, hey, let's go out for a drink. And they're like, hey, let's go for a hike. I'm like, really? OK, cool, fine, <laughs> cool. Um, so there you have it. That's, that's really the, the difference between SF and Boulder. But because of that influence of athletes and professional athletes and climbers and cyclists um, and swimmers and triathletes, there is a huge focus on, on health and wellness in the community. And that's why there's so much product development that's been done there, which is a pretty cool place. So, please come and visit. Um, we do work on a lot of different clients like Ali does. A lot of the big guys, a lot of the small guys. Whoa, not bad. Whoa, that woke you up. Hello. Now we need a cocktail. 
Um, and maybe I showed too many brands, right? <laughs> a lot of the big guys. So we worked with Annie's when they were really small, and then we got them to go really big, and they got big. Um, but we also work on a lot of startups as well, which keeps us fresh and sort of innovative. A lot of clients come to us when they're getting into the health and wellness space, and they're like, man, I got to do this authentically. I got to do it right. Can you help us think through this properly? And PepsiCo's here, and Frida, we do a lot of work with those guys as well. So let me show you some stuff. Okay. This is our playground. One of the tools that we use at SRG is called the Culinary Shifts, and I'm going to show you how it works. Um, I call it the playground for innovation. It gives us our, our innovation spaces when we're starting to do our brainstorming, whether it be with chefs or influencers or others. And here is how it's derived. So it comes from, we start up way big, and I know all of you guys are asked the same thing all the time. What's the next trend? What's hot? Like Ali said, what's the next ingredient? What should I put in here? And it really, what you need to think about is step way back and start thinking about societal trends. And that's what we do. So you have to think about the economy. You have to think about politics. You have to think about the environment. All the things today that are swirling around in your head, they're going to affect your, your uh, human behavior, how you're going to act. So it starts up here with societal forces, right? and really interesting times we're in right now. And then it kind of trickles down to these emotional factors. These are what we call SRG life drivers. We also have life forces. That would bum you out if I showed you what they look like, okay? But a lot of us live, we live in all of these areas all the time. Sometimes we're joyous. Sometimes, you know, like today, you just want to release. You want a glass of wine, you want to relax, right? So you're constantly moving between these different sort of human values. And a lot of what has to do with innovation is figuring out from what's happening with society and where you're sitting or where your brand sits and how that migrates into culinary shifts. Did I leave it? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Should I show you? You said my hair was really silky earlier. That's why I kept falling off, right? <laughs> you did say that, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So where this is all going is it, it really comes down to these big culinary shifts. And at SRG, we do this annually. They don't really sh shift that much. Every two years, we actually add a new shift. Let me show you how they work. And it really shows you how food trends manifest. So these are the culinary shifts that we're looking at for 2017 into 2018. There's nine of them, OK? So everything from food RX, which is prescriptive food. We talked about that earlier today, right? Vitamin water. Right? The great smoothie I had at Freshy when I got off the air, airplane in Sacramento with acai and all these good things. Right? That, that's food RX, prescriptive food. Meet my needs is all about customization. Thank you. Right? It's all about customization. What do I need? What do I need right now that's going to make me feel better or give me joy? Right? Comfort and community, the idea that food brings us together. And so these shifts is how we approach our culinary briefs with chefs and with a lot of the innovative people we work with to develop ideas. And sometimes we give them three or four different shifts and stay, start playing in the sandbox with that shift and see what comes out. Okay? Does that make sense? So this is an example of Food RX. I'm going to show you one. Okay? And again, the core values are prevention, health, longevity, right? Emotional well-being, all that kind of good stuff. Okay? And the life drivers, where it falls in life drivers from a human being perspective is, you know, it gives you empowerment, and that's what we just talked about. It makes you feel like you're in control. So we're all tying together really well, right? And we never even connected before we, we talked tonight. So that's an example of Food RX. So this will be a platform that I would give our innovation team to work against in product development. So let me show you some cool stuff, okay? And then I'll wrap it up. All right, avocados. Where's avocados from Mexico? Yes, a big sponsor, thank you. And I, do, I actually work on AFM, so I'm going to admit they're one of our clients. But they are very, very cool. And Larissa, you asked earlier, what product are you launching today that you couldn't have done five years ago? Freaking avocados. People on the uh, East Coast didn't even know what an avocado was four years ago, OK? No, they really didn't. I'm from the East Coast. They really didn't. But they are hot, and I call them millennial bait. Um, well, we did product development with these guys, and I'm going to give a shout out now to CIA. We did a lot of work with CIA a couple years ago, and a chef by the name of Rebecca Pizer was working in the kitchen with one of the chefs, and she was working on this guacamole thing. 
and she put it on a sheet pan on top of a plastic wrap, spread it all out, put another piece of Saran on top of it, and stuck it in the freezer. And then she pulled it out. I was like, check this, man. Check this out. And I'm like, oh my god, what is that, a piece of marble? She's like, yeah, let's see what happens. And so we like hung out, and it stayed put, and we like started cutting shapes, and then we we were like, let's make it a plate. And then we turned it into a plate and started piling things on it. And I'm like, ooh, let's make it a caprese salad. And then we like cut it in rounds and then we started building this whole thing. This is product innovation. That's what rocked my world. And what I loved about it, and you all know this, you've done it, when you're in the kitchens, especially, or in your labs, and it's like, oh, that's cool. That's it. That's the idea. And we do a shitload of testing. I get it. We do it too. But there's a point where like, you just know. That's it. So that was a really cool idea. And where it came out of is Aspire Hire. You know, it's the idea of taking your product and be like, it's like caviar. You're adding a little bit to a baked potato because I just want to, I just want a little something to make me feel special. That's where that trend sort of grows out of. Okay, this is going to be in, get me in big trouble. I am talking about Cheetos at the Culinary Institute of America. Okay, <laughs> I know Greg's probably like pulled me off the stage. All right, Cheetos, PepsiCo, beloved. My kids love them, yes? Yeah, we all love them to a certain point, right? Um, I'm a huge fan. So PepsiCo is a client of ours, and they came to us because they had this surprise hit with Taco Bell with this Doritos taco that was such a huge hit amongst young people. And so they're like, how can we start leveraging some of our CPG, our retail portfolio, into food service? What can we do? So we started looking through the whole snack portfolio and we're like, let's start thinking about Cheetos, okay? And let's start thinking about sensationalism, what I call thrill seeker food. So what we did is we put up around the room all these different menus from major chains, like Applebee's and Chili's and TGI Fridays and Cheesecake Factor, and we started analyzing their menu and trying to figure out where would Cheetos fit? Like, and how much would you charge for them? And what could really happen? And that's where the innovation all began in all of this. And what we started to see, which you all know is mac and cheese, was freaking everywhere two years ago. It was like truffle mac and cheese and chorizo mac and cheese and all these different types of plays. And we're like, ooh, Cheetos mac and cheese. So we developed the mac and Cheetos. <laughs> so they are, mac, of course, naturally, mac and cheese, um, deep fried, of course. And it's dusted with the Cheetos powder. And I know you're like, oh. God, and like tonight at like 11 o'clock, you're like, I want that, okay? So like, don't give me that CIA, blah, blah, okay? All right, so sensationalism, savor this or the trends it falls into. So, okay, and you're all thinking this, but watch this, okay? Watch this, dude, let's see if this works. Okay, we got, you know we got the regular joint, and we also got the flaming Hot. Who y'all think gonna be better? flaming Hot or regular? Regular or flaming Hot? We already know the nutrition facts on both of these, so we're gonna cook them up and we're gonna see who wins. I'm going for the flaming hot. I think the flaming hot is gonna be better. But if you're new to the channel, slap the subscribe button. Y'all slap the like button crazy. We do this. Okay? See them, like them, respect them. <laughs> All right, there you go, right? Okay. All right. So, you know, these things become natural phenomenons. Burger King picked it up immediately. It was one of the hottest LTOs they've ever had in the history of Burger King. It got so popular, obviously, we rolled it into retail, and now it's a frozen product. You'll find it at Walmart tonight at 11 o'clock. Yes. <laughs> limited time only. So LTO, yes, limited time only. Okay, Starbucks. So many of us work with Starbucks. Amazing brand. Um, they came to us because we were talking to them about snacking, and we were talking about commissary and food, and, and then we were talking about the afternoon day part, and they're developing all these food products to try to lure people in for that fourth daytime, you know? And I was like, you know, should it really be food? And it's all about women, and women are running around, like me, picking up their kids, you know, and they want a coffee. They want some kind of buzz or pick-me-up, but and so, no offense to La Cologne, so this is not, not of, no offense to you. They didn't really want the coffee. They didn't really want a sugar bomb. They just wanted a little something that gave them that buzz. And so we started brainstorming around this idea of Food RX and what could we do for women that was cool, that would lure them into, into Starbucks so that give them that little buzz but was really different. And it actually took Starbucks into a new direction. So that's when we developed Starbucks refreshers. 
this revitalization drink. These are carbonated. You can actually go into Starbucks today and get them non-carbonated. But it's with a green coffee bean, which gives you about 50 milligrams, if I'm, for, if I'm correct on that, um, in terms of caffeine. So it just gave them a little buzz. We designed the packaging so it's slim, right, and elegant, and something really quick to pick women up in the afternoon. So, and these became a quick, quick cult hit among women. And it met, again, the, the need of meet my needs. You know, look, I'm looking for something. There's nothing out there. I really don't want this. I don't really want a soda. I don't really want coffee. So what could we come up with in that kind of white space? Well, let's give this sucker a try. Uh, as you, actually, as you can see from the level, I've already given it a try on the car ride over. Um, but, you know, just for appearances sake here. I hate to sound like a shill, but damn, that's refreshing. I mean, this is the hibiscus berry flavor. It's got just a touch of sort of astringency to it, like tea would have. Good level of ice to liquid. It doesn't taste watered down, but it tastes very cool, very fresh, very light, uh, very summery. There's a little bit of sweetness to it, but it isn't excessive sweetness. It's not syrupy. It's not oversweet. It's just kind of a uh, touch of sweetness. Uh, I am crazy about this, and uh, my cat is too. Uh, yeah, yeah, hey, Nola. Okay, so clearly, I know, our YouTube, the quality of YouTube, right, all over the place. But, you know, this is your focus group, right? So we started watching social media, and we started looking at um, YouTube for all these different pickups that we got. Um, just to start measuring the product, we did not go back into focus groups with it, which is really, I think, really smart. Last but not least, or close to, is Ocean Spray. So Ocean Spray, um, really great brand. Um, so they uh, came to us and we were talking to them about doing some new juice beverage mixes and different blends, right? Very simple project. And the notion came up with, but dude, like everybody's going out for cocktails. There's so many amazing artisanal culinary cocktails happening. Culinary lounges are everywhere. And one of the issues that we discovered with consumers is that you know, some people, they can't go out every night like millennials or the younger folks to these cocktail lounges, or they want to replicate these cocktails at home. And they're doing it really poorly. You know, when you go to a barbecue and they have like vodka over here and a little cranberry over here, and there's, God forbid, a bitter over here. It's like, what do you do with bitters? So people were trying to replicate cocktails at home, and they just didn't know how to do it, and they're kind of disgusting. So they're like, we said, let's forget about, you know, the different formulations for new beverages for juices, but let's think about cocktail blends, because this is the hottest new invention. So we actually came up with this idea for mocktails, which is, again, putting like mojito and different cocktail blends together. So it's actually, and it's, I know people are like, oh, wincing. It's an amazing drink, and it's like a perfect for a cocktail mixologist. And trust me, we've talked to so many guys that helped us formulate. It's the perfect balance of the different juices and different herbs that go into these products. And what happened, which is really cool, is this is supposed to be a retail product. So we were testing this and doing some stakeholder interviews with operators and some national chains. And the national chains were like, wait a minute, like we need this. And I'm like, why do you need this? Like, yeah, because I've got like a 23-year-old dude working the bar and knows how to work a tap, and that's it. So we actually changed course again, which is the beauty of innovation, right? Is the ability to change course in the middle of the, the middle of the project. And we started selling into food service. So we launched it with food service, and then it followed into retail. And these are our little guys. At the end of a long day, everyone deserves to unwind. That's why Ocean Spray created mocktails, non-alcoholic juice drinks inspired by your favorite cocktails. With flavors like sangria, peach bellini, and my favorite, tropical paradise, it's the taste that takes you away. What gives? I took a bigger sip. <laughs> Introducing mocktails from Ocean Spray, the taste that takes you away. All right, so we didn't do the spot. Friend, a friendly agency did a spot. They did a great job. But here's the last one. This is just one more thing I have to say because I, like you, are constantly looking for what takes my breath away in food. You know, there's moments where I'm like, oh, that was just amazing. I've never seen that before. So I have this friend in Boulder. When you come out, you need to meet him. His name is Hosea Rosenberg. And he's got a restaurant called Black Belly and an amazing butcher. And it's all combined. It's very cool. You can actually rent out the butchery, too. Um, and he's a really good guy. And he's really into snout to tail, right? Snout to tail, using all the parts of the animal, which is, again, environmentally friendly. So I was at his restaurant last year. I went in with my husband. 
And I sat down, and there was a candle. Like, you know, we're going to a restaurant, there's a candle. And he came over, and he's like, oh, my God, dip your bread into the candle. And I was like, what? And he was like, dip your bread into the candle. I'm like, dude, no. And he's like, no, seriously, try it. And I was like, all right, fine. So I dipped it in. It was tallow. So we created these amazing candles with the beef tallow, rock on. And he's like, so he's selling these things for like 25 bucks in the butcher where you can buy 25 bucks for like four. And then the restaurant, they're actually a starter, an appetizer. And again, it might kind of gross you out and it's super bad for you, I know. But, you know, it's kind of fun. And it's a really, I thought, inventive way to use a product, a byproduct. And again, getting back to our trends, it's always all about sensationalism, like, wow. But then it had an earth first kind of notation to it. It was right for the environment. So that's all I got, okay? Thanks so much. So Amy was amazing but wrong. I'm actually the last woman standing in front of you in a cocktail. Um, so I'm going to make this quick. Thank you to all of our amazing presenters today. I think we collectively learned a lot. I mean, in review, if you see a millennial, hug them. They're having a tough time. <laughs> Um, robots aren't going anywhere, but they are going to make us more efficient. Analog is here to stay, and it's pretty awesome, just like culinary science. So thanks to everyone. I was going to reveal the results of our wine flavor disco that you did at registration, but we are running pretty late, so we're going to do it tomorrow. Keep you in suspense. Promise me that you will not forget your favorite wine. I hope you can sleep tonight. Um, a couple notes. If you haven't, download the app. It's RTF17. Bring a jacket tomorrow. Our lunches and receptions are going to be outside, and it's going to be a wee bit chilly. Breakfast is in the atrium at 8 a.m. And please enjoy our flavor discovery reception tonight put on by our sponsors. And we'll have a book signing by none other than Gerd Leonhard. So bring your books. All right, thank you so much.
This is Uncut with Matt Abdu at Pink Bleaker in the West Village of New York City. Having two restaurants is really kind of special for me because I get to really focus on all of my loves of cooking. Pig Beach is our Brooklyn barbecue spot, which focuses mostly on traditional barbecue, but with our New York City twist to it. And Pig Bleaker is our refined, smoke-centric comfort food restaurant, where we're taking all that theme from barbecue, but refining it to make it something more unique. So I am half Italian, half Lebanese, and I grew up my entire life with the Lebanese side telling me to sartain and the Italian side telling me to manja, both of which just mean eat, live, love, be happy. There is no greater representation of love in my family than through food. It just really made me who I am today. Today we're making a smoked pastrami pork leg with a sweet and spicy barbecue mustard sauce. This dish plays very well on our menu here because all the processes of brining, rubbing, and smoking just create such depth of flavor that it really jumps off the palate the second you eat it. And when people see brined, smoked, rubbed pastrami ham, it's one of those things that just jumps out in their mind of, oh wow, I want to try this. So we take the outside muscle of a fresh leg of pork and we first begin by brining it in a traditional pastrami brine. In our pastrami brine, we have water, salt, brown sugar, cure number one, black pepper, pickling spice, and smashed garlic. After it's brined, we pat it dry, season it pretty liberally with a house-made pastrami rub. The rub is what's really giving us all that delicious pastrami flavor and pizzazz. That combined with the smoke is what really separates this from being a traditional hand and making it something really unique. Our pastrami rub has kosher salt, ground coriander, butcher grind black pepper, sweet paprika, granulated garlic, granulated onion, Coleman's mustard powder, and light brown sugar. Season that pretty liberally, and then we place it in our smoker. Remove it from the smoker around 135 degrees. Let it rest for an hour and a half to carry up to about 145 degrees before serving. The mustard has yellow mustard, white granulated sugar, light brown sugar, apple cider vinegar, ketchup, kosher salt, Worcestershire sauce, granulated onion, granulated garlic, Frank's Red Hot, and ground black pepper. The outside muscle of this fresh pork leg is just smothered in love, from the brining process, to the rubbing process, to the smoking process, and then the applications are really endless in what you can use it for. It can be sliced paper thin and put in a Cuban sandwich, or it can be sliced and let on its own to be representative of a ham board with our country hams. It has all that love just wrapped up into one beautiful protein. So our Cuban sandwich has mustard sauce, house cured pickles, our pastrami smoked pork leg, a roasted pork loin, and melted Swiss cheese. You're getting not only that succulent, smoke, roasted ham and pork loin, but you're also getting that crisp texture of acidity of the pickles and that mustard with the unctuous cheese. It just really plays super well when you grill that bread and it's got that crunch. It just makes you want to keep biting back for more. Me personally, I would love to eat some sliced ham steak or a Cuban sandwich with a rosé or even Pinot Noir if you wanted to go that heavy. Food has that unique ability to make you just feel warm and good or put a smile on your face. And I love that all my life.